Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. Well, welcome today. I am very excited to have a fellow journalist on the show today. And this is going to be great fun for me because that's where I started. And this gentleman is the president, market president, and publisher of the Dallas Business Journal, which is a really big, big job. I can't wait to talk to him, not only about his role and what he's doing, but also about him as the man. Because I want to tell you, in speaking with him before the show and getting to know him a bit even before that, this is one authentic leader. And that's what this whole show is about. I don't have anyone on the show unless I know they are leaders who are walking their talk. So let's just get right into this and let me welcome Ollie Chaddock. You got it. I'm, I'm, I got it. <laughs> C-H-A-N-D-H-O-K. You've got it dialed in. But it's Doc. Exactly. Yeah. Chan, <laughs> Chan Doc. It's easier than it looks. Chan Doc. Yeah. What's the background with this? Tell us about that. You know, it's uh, um, it's unique, I guess. I'm, uh -huh. I'm, I'm from a variety of different places. My father was from Bombay, India, and my mom was from Manila, Philippines. So I'm half Filipino, half Indian. The name is an Indian name. Um, I probably don't pronounce it correctly because I grew up in Toronto. So, 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 well, so I, I, I sound like a Canadian, um, and I'm pronouncing an, an Indian last name. But yes, I'm I'm. I'm Canadian of Indian and Filipino heritage. What a beautiful heritage, truly. It's different, that's for sure. I, you know, I, I actually know um, uh, another per, another girl, a friend of mine, that is unrelated with the exact same mix in, in Toronto. In Toronto. Yeah, yeah. And I assume you've been to both countries and visited family and... That's uh, uh, sorry to say I haven't been <laughs> I haven't. haven't been to either. They, uh, you know, most of that the Filipino family all lives in Toronto area. Oh, okay. Um, the Indian folks, I don't know them very well. In fact, my my father passed away a long time ago, so I've kind of lost that that connection. I see. Um, my younger brother stays in contact. He's been to India, um, but I have not. I would love to go there at some point and see and meet the folks. At but I have some haven't. point. And let's talk about at some point, Ollie. The role that you have, if I can go there for a few sure. minutes, we've all been impacted heavily with COVID-19. And here you are, you've been in Dallas two years now, right? Year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah, getting there. Okay. And we're going to go back and find out how you got here <laughs> a little bit later. But I'd like you to talk to us about how you are leading in this interesting, if that's the best word I can come up with, this interesting time. How are you leading differently and what's working? But, you know, Val, we, we just talked a little bit about that. That's a very, very um, interesting question. One of the things that um, that I'm noticing, and I've thought about this quite a bit over recent recent weeks and several months now, you know, there are times recently where I felt like, hey, am I, am I doing the right things? I'm, I'm somewhat uncertain because I don't think anybody's experienced this. I, I'm sure nobody's experienced this. No. It's unprecedented. And, and, and I'm thinking of folks that are, you know, th that are in my shoes, similar you know, leaders of, of, of businesses. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little doubtful in my leadership. Is this, am I doing the right things? Am I communicating enough? Am I sharing the right type of feelings and values out to our team um, over a Zoom call or on a telephone mm -hmm. call? It's a little more difficult, right? But, you know, you take the platform out of it. Um, and I, I, you know, I bring myself back to realize, hey, I'm committed to this and I feel very confident in, in the way that I lead our team. It's, it's with very transparent um, communication. I try and make sure everybody's informed. Um, I always at least attempt to have some personal converse, conversation, some personal contact there uh, before jumping right into the, to the business stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've learned that I'm more tech savvy than I thought I was. I, I didn't realize that I could handle a, a, a video call and now it's uh, you do it in your sleep. Right. right. So there's some there's some benefits to this. You know, it's hard. To, people might think I'm crazy saying that. But, you know, it's been three months of really uh, a really difficult, challenging environment. But I but there are silver linings. You know, I, I see some of that 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 tech savviness. The communication is getting better. Uh, folks are more intentional with their time and with their work. It's not. Um, you know, there's not a lot of people taking um, 
casual coffee meetings and things. It's mm-hmm. more like, hey, you know, we, we need to be efficient here because there's not a lot of, um, we can't waste any time. So, so it, you know, learned quite a few things. But the big thing for me is, you know, I've, I've, I've many times, and I'll share with you, I've fallen into a place where it's a, a little bit of doubt. Am I leading the team the right way? And I bring myself back and realize, you know, I, I try and step out of it and observe what I'm doing and see. And it, and it shines to me that, hey, you know what, we're, we are doing the right things. It's just the environment that we're all in at the moment can create some doubt. Well, you know, thank you for being so honest about it. I would say you are doing it right. Sure, sure hope so. You are so. doing it right, <laughs> Ollie. And the things that uh, you said about having doubt, I appreciate that because what I know from speaking with leaders of all industries is there is that doubt. Mm-hmm. No one has all the answers. Everyone's figuring it out. And to the point of I've actually heard of some men who have teared at the beginning and having to work through this and you talk about being vulnerable and that's what leadership is about isn't mm-hmm. it about being you said the word transparent talk to us about leading with transparency which is a strong value where does the where does that value come from and how do you do that without um feeling like oh my goodness i'm just burying my soul right. or what's wrong with that that, that's a great question. And, and you know, I, I get praise for being transparent. And, you know, I have I have counterparts across the country that um, share this share the exact same role. And we, we lead the local business journal. And, and what I hear a lot of the time is, you know, they've heard that I'm pretty transparent. And, you know, I, I, I'm transparent with numbers and metrics and those kind of things, which is which is not a big deal. I don't I don't think that's a big deal. Other folks may think it is. Um, I'm fairly transparent with my thoughts and, and, and ideas and like the things that um, you know the numbers. The numbers you can derive information from the numbers and then figure out your next steps. Um, I think it's super valuable to be able to share the the thoughts and the the, the, the direction that I hope to head. Um, and that's the transparency I think that matters more so than just the metrics and the numbers and those kind of things. So so you know, I hear from my counterparts in different cities and they say, you know, I heard you you share X Y Z numbers and and I said why not right? Uh huh. But you know the deeper question should be what what are you what else are you sharing? You know you can certainly share those numbers yourself and, and hopefully everybody appreciates that. Mm-hmm. But of more importance to me is the you know here's what I'm thinking we need to do. Oh. Um, where I think some of you know not not to throw, throw anybody under the bus, but I think there are some leaders out there that keep that to themselves. Yes, there are. I, and it's important you know selfishly to gain some input from mm-hmm. the from the team, um, but also to to. Uh, um, to have them feel like they're part of it and there's a little bit of trust there, you know? that That's the point, isn't it? To right. make them feel like they're a part of it. You know, interesting you bring that up because at one point I was coaching a gentleman, a vice president of a company where um, he did not share his thoughts and he was struggling with building the team and building trust. And so I suggested to him a simple little thing. I said... Now, this is a big company, and you've got a beautiful, wonderful cafeteria, right? Yes. I said, do you eat there? No. I I don't eat or I bring my lunch. And I said, <laughs> interesting. All right. Well, what if, and I, I stole this from someone. I'm not going to say it was my idea particularly, but um, it worked for someone else, and so I shared it. And I said, what about if you just took a three by five card and twice a week just twice a week write down on that three by five card maybe three things no more than three there's something magical about three i don't Mm -hmm. know what Mm -hmm. speakers say i'll give you three (laughs) points write down three things you're working on to your point three three thoughts you have Mm -hmm. and go through the line find a group of people that you know are working for you and just go up and they'll be scared to death at first but ask them if you can join them. And then at some point, pull that card out and say simply, you know, I've been working on some things that I, I'd really like your thoughts on. Could you give me some thoughts on these things? He did that, Ollie, for uh, about a month. Okay. And was totally amazed at A, the ideas he got, and B, the things that he didn't know were going on. Right. And C, the questions that people asked. And it was a total pivot. 
So that's transparency. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's terrific. I, th there is that, um, you know, you, you gain benefit from hearing from, from the team. Mm -hmm. But, but peripherally, you're, you're empowering these folks to, to sure. share their thoughts. And, you know, I, I don't know everything. So the fact that I, my team is, is 25 and I can, you know, I'm only one brain. I need 24 <laughs> others to contribute. And, and it certainly helps to hear from them. And so I, I just feel like that's an important, um, an important trait. And, you know, it, it, it helps them own their position and own their role. And they, they, they thrive in that type of environment. So I think that's an important part of it is that, uh, is that trust and empowerment and transparency, of course. So you, uh, you are a pretty open guy, and you're also a can-do guy. And you came to Dallas ablazing with ideas. <laughs> Tell us how you got here. So, so I, well, I'm, in, I'm born and raised in Toronto. I, I, I had my childhood in Toronto. I played golf. And so, so golf became a, a major part of my life. I, I was offered several golf scholarships. And um, my wife makes me say this. It, it's, uh, uh, most of it was academic scholarships. And, and the people rather hear about the golf, I guess. But, but that's two <laughs> very important things. Two scholarships, not one. Yeah, but so it all kind of shook out somehow. And I ended up in Charlotte at uh, a school called Queens College. It's now actually called Queens University of Charlotte. They've grown dramatically. Uh, great school right in the heart of the city. Um, and and so, so I spent some time in outside sales and kind of learned the trade. Uh, and then in 08... I started working for the Charlotte Business Journal. And, and what was most interesting about that is I was hired to do workshops and, and seminars. And this, this was the previous publisher's idea to grow our subscriber base by education-based marketing. And so I would do seminars and classes for um, salespeople or, or um, business owners and people in transition for that matter and show them how to find sales leads or just any kind of leads uh, more importantly, connections in, in, in the business journal. And, and so it took off. It became a, a very um, important thing in Charlotte. I was doing this in five days a week. I was probably doing this 10 or 12 times. And, oh, my gosh. And I can so see you doing it. It was the, the, the most fun job I ever had, really? uh, except for the one now. Uh, <laughs> so, so it was great. It took off. And, and I did that for a while. And, and so I was at Charlotte for six years. I crossed the street to our corporate headquarters, which is also in Charlotte. So I, the best part about that gig was I, I, I was an internal consultant, um, traveled to 20 of the 40 business journals nationwide. So, so oh it served me very well because I saw how different publishers operate, mm -hmm. um, you know, different ideas that I could uh, um, kind of steal from these other markets and bring them home, quote unquote home. Yeah. Um, and then after a year of that, I was promoted into the publisher role in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, that publication is called the Triad Business Journal. So, so smaller, smaller community, smaller um, business, smaller publication. Uh, but we did fairly well. Everything went great. And three and a half years in, I, I was asked to move to a bigger city. Um, and you know, what's bigger than this, bigger right? Than so, this. so, so, so here we are in, in, in DFW. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I'm here, and it's been a year and a half, and it's been terrific. I mean, I've I've loved it. Going from North Carolina to Texas. Um, or vice versa, for that matter, it's not that challenging. There, there are some mm. similar, um, similar cultural things that make it comfortable. Well, you're comfortable. <laughs> you're just comfortable. Oh, not this all the is, time. <laughs> no, I bet you are. All right, so you land in Dallas almost a year and a half ago, you mm -hmm. said. What's one thing to this point that you use that can-do attitude on and you know you've made an impact in our city? You know, uh, we, what's what's the kind of highest on my list is is the making connections, right, and getting to know people. I I, I really enjoy the, um, you know, I, I I'm going to use that word again. It's somewhat selfish because I enjoy it so much. Just getting to know people. It's who you are? Yeah, and and I, you know, I'm I'm willing to um, you know be out in the community, go to different events. I don't want to hide behind anything. I need to be out there and plugged in, and. You know, I, I think that's that's the biggest thing on my list that is of, hmm. of you know of most importance to me is to be plugged in, um, get to know folks, and I think you know it served it has served me very well over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier I used to do these job transition seminars, and one of the things that was was I would continue to talk about was. Um, making connections and, and I say that quite simply it sounds simple but mm -hmm. you know I feel very very strongly that if you take a group of your friends or an individual for that matter and then and, and connect them with an unrelated individual or person that they don't know you benefit the most as the connector you're the per you know you've created a relationship but ultimately now now I've got 
those two relationships plus the one that exists between the two of them. And, and yes. for me, that's a that's that's the can do for me. That's the hey, I can I'm I'm good at that and I'm comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. So I like to I like to do that socially. I like to do that in the business community. Um, the the word that I use is insulating yourself with with a network with people. Um, the more and more you can do that the more you can accomplish because you're surrounded with a with a larger group of folks and hopefully they all have good hopefully they maintain those good relationships oh i'm sure they yeah, do with but, you but you can you can you know you can accomplish anything when you're when you're insulated with a with a very strong network and a group of people that's a that's a great teachable point of view and and that to me that is i would say one of your gifts because not too many people just love to get out and socialize <laughs> all the time very few do, honestly. And so the fact that you just do it naturally, I'm just going to give you that statement. I think it's a gift. Well, Valerie, so do you. Well, thank you. <laughs> we we, we connected right. very quickly. That was easy. And That's I, you true. Know, I, That's I, true. I, yeah, I, I, I hear you. It's, it's very, I'm thankful that I'm that way. And I, I think about that a lot. You know, it's not a, I'm just, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just like anybody else. When you walk into a room and you don't know the, the 20 people there, there's a little bit of uneasiness, as you would expect, but yes. I, I guess for me that uneasiness lasts a little uh, shorter period of time than for most folks. Uh-huh. So, so you just kind of break through and, and make the connection, and five minutes in, you're you, you've made a new friend. That's so true. Yeah. If you just start asking them about them, mm-hmm. they'll think you're the greatest conversationalist <laughs> in the world. Right. Right. You know, we're talking about values here. I want to go there. I'd love for you just to talk about your values what some of the strong values you have where did they come from and really importantly how do you live them at work how do you show up in a way that people know what's really important to you mm-hmm. um you know one, one of the things that i learned you know both both my parents grew up kind of this is interesting. Actually, my dad grew up fairly wealthy, which is the opposite of what I was going to say. But he didn't. He he walked away from it. So so he left India when he was in his um, later teens to move to to um, to North America. Um, he he landed in Toronto, and and so he he kind of let go of all that. My my huh. my mother grew up in a in a very um, uh, almost in poverty in, in in the Philippines, and so so what I saw growing up was this work ethic that they were both committed. They both worked the entire time. Um, they, they, my, my father, in fact, he was a, he was a, a resident, a residential realtor. Um, I don't think he didn't, I don't think he stopped working. It was just a constant on the go seven days a week. And I, I saw that, right. And to me, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's, there's a commitment to the work and Hey, you know what, I'm going to put in the time. And I think part of that is the leadership thing. People see that. I don't expect anybody to work 12 hours a day. That's certainly not my thing, but you know, I think there are times that where, where I feel like I need to put in a little more time than my team. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously it needs to be strategic and smart. I, I can't just sit there for 12 hours <laughs> and say no. that I'm working. No, you but, have a family. R- right. But, you know, being first generation, I'll, I'll say North American, mm-hmm. um, I, I saw that. I mean, they both had to really like kind of scratch and claw for everything they got. And and, and I witnessed it firsthand. So for me, that value of, of just putting in the time and work ethic um, is high on my list. Uh, you know, I, I wear a suit every day, so it's a little, you know, and I'm sitting in air conditioning. So when I say work ethic, um, some of that requires a little bit of uh, uh, intellectual property. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, again, when I was a, when I was younger, I, I worked at the golf course, of course, and our, whoever that, that uh, the general manager was at the time, we had to dig trenches and build fences. And so, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, that's learned, humbling. I learned some work. Yeah. 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 And I, I feel like that's a, that's a very important value for folks to have. It's something to, to appreciate, you know, I, I appreciate it. Now, now keep in mind, it has to be very um, strategic, right? Like I said, it, it can't just be, I'm sitting here for 12 hours, you know? And your kids, <clears throat> tell us about your wife and kids, because you've been with your wife and kids for every day for a while. Yeah. How's so that going? Whole new world, right? So, so how are I, they dealing with this? All this? They're, you know, it, it's, uh, the kids are, are great. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we said, Hey, you're, you're, you don't have to go to school. Yes. You have to go to school, but we'll do it in the kitchen. Um, they were ecstatic because, you know, they, they're, they're home with, with mom and me. And now, now luckily my, my, my wife is a stay at home mom. So. Um, she, she, in fact, she went from stay-at-home mom to school teacher. Exactly. This was very a very quick transition towards the end of March. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the school districts had a, a, a 
bigger transition trying to create curriculum no and kidding. things. Yeah. We, got, we owe the teachers. Oh, absolutely. We and and so, so um, speaking of that, my wife said, you know, this was probably a month into this. She, mm-hmm. she said, you know, we were just going for our walks and things. And she said, man, I, I really appreciate teachers. Oh. I, I never, you know, she, we, we've always appreciated the teachers, but we didn't know how hard it was. And, yes. and she, every day I'd walk out of my little office at, you know, six o'clock or six thirty, and and she looks like she got beat up, and and it was just trying to stick with the, uh, with the curriculum, with the program, and yeah. it's hard, yeah, you know, and hard. and uh, you know we're we're in our early forties, it's a lot harder. The fifth grade right now, right now, it's a lot harder than the fifth grade I knew. <laughs> it is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's hard. My goodness, they're <clears throat> teaching calculus, and I don't think I ever had it in high school. <laughs> it's it's amazing. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting time. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to get to some fun questions. You have no idea what Uh-oh. they will All right. be. All right. I don't either, actually. Sometimes I don't <laughs> know what's coming out. What's something that no one knows about you, Ollie? Oh, uh, man, no one. Yeah. It's hard. I tell my wife everything. I'm transparent. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she might. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to think. So she might know. So, so you know, okay, so here's – this might – sound really crazy but I, I've been on a dance floor um, dan- actually dancing with with, <laughs> with with Michael Jordan no kidding yeah yeah whoa right yeah this was back in Charlotte days but yeah I mean he's a you know he's a regular in Charlotte and you know as famous as he is if you're in Charlotte you're likely gonna bump into Michael Jordan and and I did and it was late at night on the dance floor and it was fun and it was a kind of a treat to see you know probably you know the the it's one good. of the two best athletes of all time on on a dance floor <laughs> Could he dance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's having a great time. Oh, my God. See, that's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I've got a couple more. Um, Let's see. I think I want to talk to you about what? Let me look because I wrote down a couple of really good ones here. Okay, if you could live in any time in history, when would you live? (laughs) That's a great question, actually. (laughs) I know. That's a great question. It's a good one. You know, uh, I would, I think I'm a, you know, kind of a middle 20th century guy. I think I would have loved living in, in the, in the fifties and sixties. I just, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty casual. I'm pretty laid back. I, you know, I, I appreciate traditional values and just, you know, working hard and those kind of things. And Mm -hmm. that's my impression. I wasn't around then, but that was my impression of that, uh, that generation where, Hey, you know what? We, we eat dinner together every night at six o'clock and we go to work at eight o'clock and you know, those kind of things seem, you know, maybe it's just my current age and my kids and seeing them in action for the Uh last three months. I, I kind of, um, I desire that environment almost, Mm. but it sounds, it seems like it was a very wholesome time. You know, Mm -hmm. everybody kind of, um, worked well together and stuck together. Now, of course, as with any generation, there were challenges which we, we know about and sure. It just sounds sounds like a uh, from what little I know about it. It seems like a, a time and place I would love to be now. Coronavirus, withstanding, uh, I, I love it right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Take that away, and I think things are terrific. You know, it's it, yes. it, uh, um, you know, it, it's, like I said, it's not not perfect at any time, but and there are certainly challenges right now. But there are just you know, I, I think about the business community and the advances that we've had technologically and those kind yes. of things. It's a very interesting time at the moment, and I think it's it's stimulating almost in all of the things that we have available to us, and I appreciate that. Yes. So, I, you know, I can't narrow it down to one, but, you know, I, I think back to the, the 50s, 60s, and then obviously today. You know, speaking of, of today and your positivity of, of the things that are good to come out of this, one of the things I really hope, Ollie, will come out of this is that families will realize it is a joy to sit down and be with family more. Yeah, we we, we unplug That's every great. night. Yeah, and and you know one of the silver linings to this whole um, environment we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife and I started walking around the, the the neighborhood. I never would have done that before. I would have thought it was a waste of time or yeah. just kind of I don't have the time. Mm-hmm. We go we go twice a day. I mean, at seven a.m. we'll walk or two miles or so, and then in the evening another another mile or so, and it's. Never would have done that. It just sounds so far fetched to me, and now it's, I can't live without it. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah, and I love you it. see neighbors that are see, also. It's crowded out there. See, isn't yeah, that interesting? Yeah, I great. never knew my neighbors. Well, now we're sitting out on the front porch on, you know, six feet apart. But I, I hope that continues. I hope that yeah, continues. Yeah. I and I think it will. I think people are finding finding the value in that. What's the funniest thing that you've ever done? 
funniest thing I've ever done. So, so this might, you, you'll love this. <laughs> you probably could figure this out. I, I used to, I used to do TV commercials. Um, you did? Not, not when I was little. Oh um, when I was in my twenties, huh. um, I, I was walk. I was actually making a sales call in Charlotte downtown and uh, a guy drives up to me and says, Hey, Ollie, I remember his name is Vince. Good, good guy. Still am connected with him on the socials and that. Um, he said, Ollie, he, he said, you look, you look pretty good. Um, can I take a photo of you? Oh, uh, this it, the, scary, right? It's weird. Could but, be. Very weird. But this uh-huh. was, this was, had to be 2002, something like that. Oh, three. And I, I being somewhat maybe stupid, I said, sure, go ahead. And he took a picture. He said, give me your business card. I gave him a business card. He called me up and said, Hey, I'm going to send you to this place. They'll pay you 300 bucks. And all you got to do is carry around a, a, a case of Bud Light. And so I showed up, it was a, it was a commercial shoot. And, uh-huh. and I, you know, at the time I was fresh out of college, 300 bucks is, Good a, money. is a lot of money, right? Yes. So, so he said, you want to keep doing this? And I said, I'd love to. So if you really try hard, you can find me in, in various, uh, I think we did some things for uh, Exxon on the run for, for Anheuser-Busch and all these weird commercials. The, the, the crazy part is, I was always framed as the as the Hispanic guy or the Latino guy, oh. and, and I'm completely 100% Asian, right? And so, so there were some times where they asked me to, can you speak? And it's not at all. I'm no. from Toronto. <laughs> but but it was, you know, that that's a, a funny thing I've done. But that yet, is fun. at the time, it was great. It was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always like to ask leaders who are on the show, Ollie, what books you read? Mm-hmm. What books do you read? So, so you know, this... When I first got here, um, I, this it's pretty simple. But when I got here, you know, new to Texas, all excited to be here. I, I read Friday Night Lights. I've, I've seen I've seen ah. the movie, watched the show, and I, I figured I would read it. And it's I, I think it's better than the movie. Um, that was somewhat important just to gather some cultural stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a um, um, a friend just now, local guy, um, a Pete Havel, send me Arsonist in the Office. And I, you know, I read business books in, in, in general and those kind of things, you know, it, it, I'm not a voracious reader. I wouldn't say I'd go through a book in a night like that. Like, you know, the arsonist in the office took me a week or so, mm-hmm. but those kind of things slowly seep in is the way that I feel. And, and I, I think that's important. I think those are the, the types of, um, um, where I am in my life, that's what's important to me to read those business books. You know, um, one of your previous guests, Dale Petrosky with the chamber, um, he suggested I pick up Radical Candor, and and yes. I did. I, I did it as soon as Dale said, and and I, I'm just now starting, and it's exciting. I'm excited to read this, and part of it is I, I'm you know, and I'm looking at it through the don't tell Dale this, but I'm looking at it through the eyes of myself, of course, yeah. but also um, trying to imagine if I was in Dale's shoes. You know, Dale's a very yes. visible leader in the yes. community, and I'm thinking about some of the things that he, you know, a lot of it is about communication, and mm-hmm. he has to figure out how to do that, not just with his team. But there are a lot of business leaders depending on Dale. And, and so, you know, I, I'm trying to think of those things through his eyes and, and re- going through the book and reading it. It's very, um, it's very insightful, it's insightful. I feel like I know Dale a little better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I think the, uh, the essence of asking that question is that what I find is that leaders do continue to learn. At least the ones that come on this show. Yeah. I cannot imagine anyone that just says, well, I'm through college, and so, you know, books, what the hey. Do you like the hardback books, like the real book, or do you like reading it online? That's a that's a cool question. I, I like the hardback books for show, because uh, I, <laughs> I, I have a bookshelf in my office, and it looks great when they're all lined okay, up. Okay, well, but, these are going to be in your right, office, okay? When, when I read, when I, you know, the, the, I'm more comfortable reading the, the softback books, uh-huh. because, you know, I'm, I'm typically, before I go to bed, so I'm lying down, and it's easier to... It's easier to hold one of those than flip the hard covers. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I yeah. get that. So I, this is so funny you're talking about this because I'm moving my office after 25 years of having an office, Ali. I'm going to come home and oh, just wow. do what I do at home because yeah. who needs really an office anymore? Everything is online and, and the coaching is online and the workshops, I'm traveling there and so forth and so on. Well, in doing so, I had to gather up all the books <laughs> And bring them all home. And I could not let many of them go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Having said that, I don't think I'll buy another book for a long time. <laughs> I'll just read it online. Right. So I don't have any room for it. You got a lot to go, right? I got a lot to go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, 
is there is there any anything that you would leave with the audience? You've given us some great things already about insulate yourself with others and surround mm -hmm. surround yourself with people. We become those we become the person with whom we surround ourselves. Isn't that true? Right, absolutely. It's important. Uh, and then I love the part about being transparent and 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 you said being doubtful in times of crisis is normal. And I sure hope so something. because I I've experienced it. Right? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, is there anything else around? Uh, what if you were talking to Ace, your 11 year old son, and you were talking about, um, okay, son, here's what work is like. You first of all, I didn't come up with his name. That was my wife. Even though it that is, is a, it, a is a, it is it is a golf related name, but yeah, it it. Uh, um, she just said Ace, and I said that's perfect. It is a perfect. <laughs> so I like that. I sure hope he likes it. That's <laughs> that's the key. Uh, the the you know what what is what I can leave and what I would tell Ace is is um, really to you know, I don't know how you say this in, in one word, but to be an observer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what serves me very well is my ability to 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 um, read the crowd and read individuals. Uh -huh. uh, so so I, I I pride myself in paying attention, which you know a lot of the time I I'm, I'm doing the talking but I, I really want to read tones and feelings and body language and those kind of things those are very important to me of course you read the words um, <clears throat> I would tell them to pay attention instead of instead of being the one that you know I hate to say it, that, that leads the conversation I think it's important to hear first mm -hmm. um, and then formulate what what you might want to say or might not want to say uh, I think that's an important way to look at things in, in every interaction I do that socially um, you know, I'd like to get to know folks and where they're coming from. It's not always just about the words. I think you can kind of analyze feelings and, and um, the tones, as I said. Um, what's coming out might be different than what the words actually say. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whether you're a, a, a CEO or a, a salesperson or a, um, anybody, for that matter, a, an athlete, um, I think you need to hear first before you can act and communicate. So, so for me, that would be a big conversation that I would have with Ace when he's ready. Um, and, and that would kind of lead the start charge now. For me. He's 11. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's getting there. Yeah. <laughs> what a great conversation. And I, I just will give you a, a compliment. I mean, sincerely is, and the audience can see this, your eye contact is like spot on. And Ollie, when someone can look at the, another person in the eye and maintain that depth of listening, just what you said, mm -hmm. observing, it also says, your eye contact also says, you're really listening. And you're not listening for yourself. You're listening, what I'm getting from all of this, is for the other person. In other words, emotional intelligence, those who have it, and you do, are those who are paying attention to other people and other surroundings and other experiences, experiences and then enveloping them for themselves. So. I will leave you with that compliment, and I mean it sincerely. Thank you, Val. I, I really appreciate up. that. It'll show up. It, it's very important to me, of course. And you know, and and you know, from what I can tell, you're the same way. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And you look good. And that leads for me to say to the audience, I have to thank Betty Ryder for what I am wearing today. She is just an amazing woman. She has a beautiful boutique. Isn't this great? You look terrific. Colorful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks yeah. to Betty. <laughs> I'm glad I dressed up to uh, sit next to we you. We both dressed <laughs> up. Isn't that good? So I just want the audience to know it's at uh, Betty Ryder at Preston Center, a great European, very, very special uh, boutique. And you stop in and tell them that you saw this on the air. And so, Ollie, thank you so much. We're going to look so forward to hearing more about what the Dallas Business Journal is doing and other things that you're coming up with as a leader. So I appreciate you being on the show. Wish you all the blessings. you the same, Val. I thank really you. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. And until next time, you just stay authentic and listen up. I have a gift for you. I've said this now for several times, and I still have it for you. <laughs> if you are interested in getting a free gift, all you have to do is go to ValerieAndCompany.com, ValerieAndCompany.com forward slash gift. Hit that button, and you will get an article that I wrote about living and leading in this disruptive world. And then the other thing is, if you enjoy these podcasts, please to the side, hit that red button, the subscribe button. It's so interesting that Ollie, I find, and I'm guilty of it sometimes too, 
we watch podcasts and we like them, but who hits the red button? <laughs> well, Google Juice needs it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hit the so red hit button. Hit that red button, right? <laughs> All right. Until next time. Bye for now. All right. Here is the Valerieism for today. We move toward what we put forward. We move toward what we put forward in our minds. So let's all go for it, play it big. That really kind of says it all. I know we are dealing with a lot of things in our world today that could cause us to get down, lose our mojo, maybe doubt ourselves too much. But I'm just gonna say, don't do that. Don't you dare allow yourself to do that. You're leaders. You get up every day and you say to yourself, I'm going to make an impact and I'm going to make a difference because that's what I'm here to do in this world. So move forward because if you do, you're going to, when you, I should say, move toward moving forward because when you do, you will play it big. And why not? Who wants to play small? And that's my Valerieism for today. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.